Good evening, everyone. Um, we've just got someone just starting, so I might, maybe I'll wait for a second, <laughs> let them in. Okay. All right. So, good evening. I'm Deb Collard, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar about the impact of neglect for children in care with Annette Jackson, who's with us, um, whom I will get to introduce herself in a moment, but also let you know that this webinar is being funded by Carer Cafe, the statewide learning and development strategy. And I would also like to show my respect and acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to um, their elders, past, present and emerging. And I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. And I'd also like to acknowledge any present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us tonight. And I've just got to work out um, and acknowledge their strength and resilience. So just a little bit about me. I'm the project coordinator at FCAV and I've worked in a variety of roles um, over the past 27 years, I think it is now, in home-based care and also grew up in a fostering family when I was much, much younger. Um, so I think my parents did that when I was about three to 18. So yeah, quite a long time ago. Um, but anyway, a um, little bit about Annette. Annette has conducted research in collaboration with La Trobe University, um, Bruce Perry and a, I think a few others, if I've got it right, and completed 216 surveys, which did include Victorian foster carers um, as part of that research. And um, when they, be, from my understanding, and I'm sure Annette will add to this, um, when they began, there was very little research completed on interventions for children um, who had experienced neglect, nor information about how children can actually recover from neglect. So um, Annette will definitely explore that in a much more detailed manner. So I'd like to introduce Annette, who completed her research just last year in 23. And, um, and her paper is called, Can We Undo Harms from the Past? So it's very, very current. And Annette, welcome hi. and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Deb, and hi, everyone. It's actually a real pleasure to be with you tonight because I was so grateful at the um, response rate by, by foster parents here in Victoria and also really appreciative of the support from FCAV and a number of the uh, uh, CSOs and also Aboriginal community controlled organisations who supported the research. So very happy to be a part of tonight. Um, in terms of my background, <clears throat> in addition to the study on neglect, I've worked out that this year is my 40th year of working mm -hmm. in uh, with our kids in a whole range of roles. I've worked in child protection, I've worked in uh, out of home care, um, therapeutic services, and um, always to do with our children and their families and carers. And um, as Deb knows, at one point I had the great honour to be a respite foster parent, um, which I sadly couldn't do for, I think I was a respite carer for about two years until mm. other family circumstances um, led to that changing, but that's something I hold very dear yeah. to my yeah. heart. Wonderful at the time. So, yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, so we might launch into um, what neglect actually includes. And then I also understand that there's um, what is called serious neglect. Um, and within Australia, we have from um, the research I gather, 8.9% of children in Australia experience neglect. And of those children coming into the child protection system, in Victoria, 96% of those kids have actually experienced one or more types of neglect. So that, to me, is very, very significant and says a lot. So 
Annette, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the different types of neglect? Sure. So I will um, <clears throat> show a couple of slides and um, but I'll, I'll turn them on and off and I'll apologise ahead of time for my post COVID vaccination cough. <laughs> um, so if I have some kind of coughing fit, I will um, go on mute. Uh, but let me just share my screen and um, and welcome, Amy. What we're asking is that everyone just puts themselves on mute and um, um, turns their camera off for the time being. Sure. Thank you. And I'll just try that again with my, there we go. Um, so what is neglect? Um, in some ways, the definition of neglect can be as simple as when a child has not had their essential needs met by those in a position to do so. And <clears throat> I'm more interested, this is not a legal definition, but this is a definition backed up by a lot of research that's, because even in, you know, there are families where mum may not be in a great place to do the care, but dad or grandma steps mm -hmm. in and at the end of the day, child's needs are met. But when um, when we experience when we see children who've experienced neglect, it really means it's not just mum or it's not just dad. It means that that whole circle around the family, uh, for whatever reason, is not either seeing or meeting the child's needs. So when we think about um, serious neglect, it's when those needs have not been met to the level where there's actually significant harm to the child. So as Deb asked about the different types of neglect, I like to start by thinking about, well, what are these essential needs? And so there are so many needs that we know of um, for children, and we know they look different from the baby through to the adolescent, <clears throat> but the emotional needs, the medical needs, children's cultural needs, which we learn more and more about, uh, their physical needs, both um, are not only medical, but, you know, the day-to-day -day, life-giving needs that they have and their developmental needs. So when we think about different types of neglect and we think that it's about when their needs are not met, this helps us understand why these are also understood as different types of neglect. So I'll just kind of go back there again. These needs being not met means that there are these types of neglect. And whether it's serious or not, very much depends on the um, impact on the child at the time. Great, thank you. Um, so what can a carer look for to actually help them identify that the child in their care has experienced neglect? So I, I imagine there's a whole range of different <laughs> things to sort of have a look at. Um, Yes. Including physical, yeah, yeah, global, so, everything. Um, you know, it's really interesting. One of the questions I asked carers in the survey was I asked everybody to think about a child who mm -hmm. they thought had experienced neglect. And I asked the carers and I asked all the different professionals the same question. And then I asked the carers in particular, well, how did you know mm -hmm. that the child had experienced neglect? And for so many of them, it was because they could tell from the child's behaviours and from what the child also told them. Uh -huh. And um, yes, some of them, some carers found out through the at the time of referral. Some that some found out through the um, foster care supervision. Some found out through care team meetings. Um, but I think it's so important that you know we know the strength of that carer child relationship. Um, particularly when it's side by side and you just have those incredibly poignant, rich conversations um, for the children who are of an age to talk. For the younger child, sometimes with neglect, you can literally smell it. I mean, let's face it, it's it's visceral. <clears throat> the child comes to your care and you can see the... Mm -hmm you know, the marks on their skin from the untreated mm -hmm. infections and you can um, 
uh, you know that they, you know, they're not toilet trained at a certain age, or they don't have the language that you might expect. Mm. And um, so sometimes it's not hard. Yes, um, and I know even like um, when I was working in foster care, we had a little boy whose teeth were so rotted. You know, he was in agony, and and that had been left for so that's, long. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was consulting around an 18-year-old who was um, had a significant intellectual disability, um, but he had this really strong connection to the smell of his own urine. And when I looked at his childhood history, he'd been left in, in his cot mm-hmm. for days at a time, and that was the smell of comfort yes. for him. So, um, you know, it takes curiosity, um, not just of carers, obviously, but of the whole care team around them, Um, but also really watching for those signs. And so I'll just again go back to the PowerPoint and um, just show some of the uh, problems that are commonly associated with neglect You know, one of the things that's interesting is that people can sometimes think that of all the different types of maltreatment, um, neglect is not as serious as other forms of Mm. abuse. The research tells us that that's not right, that in some, for some of these difficulties, neglect can be more impactful. Um, For others, it's just as impactful. So it's um, it's it's a very important thing. When I hear somebody say, oh, thank goodness it's only neglect, I take a deep breath and then I think, well, hold on, what essential needs of the child were not met and what, therefore, are they trying to do now to survive that absence in their life? And so from the research that I did, um, I've just summarised some of the more frequent problems that were associated with uh, neglect. And from a physical point of view, sleep problems, as you can see, was nearly two-thirds of the children, of the 216 children, had sleep problems. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I'm guessing Mm -hmm. many children in in the care of those joining us today will um, have sleep problems. And that'll look different from, again, from a young age to an adolescent. There's also um, quite, you know, nearly, um, well, just over two-fifths of the children had atypical weight. They could either be overweight or underweight. And again, some people think, oh, well, if neglect, then it means physical neglect, it means they'll be underweight. But we also see children, for example, who binge eat Mm -hmm. because they can't trust that food will always be there. And so there's a whole range of reasons why Um, you know, there can be these different problems associated with neglect. I'll also just share briefly some of the comments that carers in particular made in their surveys, and I won't read all of these out, but you'll see here just examples of not just the child's experience of neglect, but what that, how that led to a problem for the child. So, you know, the first one, the child wouldn't eat, was very underweight, was infested with lice. And they said, the carer said, the lack of available food led to the child not eating regularly, craving food and having difficulty identifying when they're hungry. So it's just such a powerful description of um, <clears throat> how understanding that absence of that essential need leading to the behaviour that the carer was seeing around the dinner table. Um, the, the Near the bottom of the three-year-old, um, nightmares and extreme fear of being put to rest is an example of the sleep problems that I talked about earlier with, um, with neglect. And, you know, here's the, the last example, <clears throat> a bit similar to what you were saying, Deb, about you know, lack of medical attention leading to dental issues, lots of holes in the teeth, lack of available food, not attending school, leading to poor social skills, et cetera. So that's just the physical health problems. Then we've got the developmental problems, which were much more um, uh, frequent 
for these children. And that included, if you look at impulsivity and attention, problem solving, not doing well at school and short-term memory, they're also, if you group them together, they can also fit the definition of ADHD. Yes. And, you know, if you've got children who have been diagnosed with ADHD and the medication's not working, probably means the diagnosis isn't accurate. Still can be a good cluster, a good, a good description of the cluster of symptoms, but it may be due to another reason. And neglect is a really good example of a reason that can lead to those types of developmental problems. Oh, that's amazing. And here's this carer survey about a six-year-old child. And I'm just going to read it out because it was such a beautifully described way of thinking about this child. The kindergarten teachers thought English was her second language, but no other language was spoken. Initially, she had extensive memory problems and found it difficult to retain new information. But hey, this is improving. The child has repressed memories and remembers virtually nothing prior to her removal from the family at five years. That's only one year earlier. Her fine motor skills were quite behind. She is catching up. She still struggles with impulse control. This has been a significant issue for her stealing food at home and at school, gaining no pleasure from other experiences. She still has limited and reduced levels of concentration and issues with working memory. This child struggled at school at the beginning of the year and was significantly behind. So just so I think that this carer just paints such a powerful picture mm. of um, what this little uh, girl has experienced. Um, when we're looking then at relational problems, and of course these can be the bane, can't they, where you just, it's so hard to see if either to form a connection with the child or they overshare and that you see that really indiscriminate behaviour. And in fact, it, you know, to be honest, sometimes it can be a bit creepy and you think, whoa, mm. no, boundaries, hello. <laughs> and um Again, we know with neglect, just with, with other types of um, abuse, the child has learnt these behaviours in order to survive and they're not going to just drop them because we tell them that we care for them and that they can trust us. And, you know, look who I'm talking to. You guys know that better than anyone. So some of the relationship problems, well, you know, the poor social skills, the few friendships. Um, one of the people I interviewed said, how many of our children, when they first come to our care, have ever been invited to a birthday party? Yeah. And you just think, oh, and then when they are, they don't know how to manage it because mm. it's so out of their experience. It can be just as stressful as if we were taking them to court. So helping them to kind of learn these things in small doses. Of course, trusting others is such a key thing. Um, and they may either be trusting everybody and be, you know, at risk in other ways or um, have learnt not to trust anyone. Uh, so, again, this is just um, an example. And some of the quotes here from carers, um, I think of some of these as being the looking for love in all the wrong places. I don't know who said that quote Originally, it's probably Shakespeare or somebody. <laughs> but, um, you know, here's the three-year-old who didn't know how to play. Um, the eight-year-old who didn't learn how to have develop good relationships. Um, and the seven-year-old offering up love very easily, taking anything and everything he could whenever he could, a matter of survival. Um Emotional problems. Emotional regulation, of course, will be a big feature for many of these children. Um, and you can, again, you can see the connection between that, not coping with stress, low self-esteem, difficulty in expressing emotions um, and being difficult to comfort. Um, but I think it's really sad to see that 43% of these children had a sense of hopelessness. 
and again, some of these children were very young. In terms of what some of the carers told us, um, <clears throat> neglect in the child's history and in their current placement, so this is actually from a professional survey, contributed to her being very rejecting of comfort. She pushes carers away and hides under beds and in small places. She also screams when outside the house, so her carer has stopped taking her out. Um, this one around significant unmet and develop, emotional and developmental needs, lack of safety and security, failure of secure attachment and trust. The child grew with fear in an unsafe and unpredictable world. That's such a common experience for the children that we care for. <coughs> in um, this last one, no hugs. The child has no hugs and she's now 15. Wow. And that's been her experience. I know how bad it was in the first lockdown. Yes. Um, you know, just imagine having a life um, and therefore that struggle to feel. <laughs> and then mental health problems. I'm not going to go through much through these. These were not actual diagnoses, but just what were the symptoms. And even post-traumatic stress, um, you know, it was more than 50% of these children. And again, you can see some of the comments made here by carers. Um, I'll just read the last one. Although I had said to her that all the food in my home was available, even if, you know, to only to try it, I still found food hidden in spots around her room where she had tried the food and not liked it, but hid it away. Just highlights that, you know, again, she's the child surviving. She's doing what she thinks she needs to do, but she can't trust something as simple as being able to go and get an apple. Yeah. And that's quite um, common, isn't it? Ah, uh, so much, so much. Um, and that, you know, the care at the, the top quote, serious neglect means he developed poor frameworks, that the world is not safe, that he will not have his needs met, that it's unpredictable and that he is not worthy. Now, if that's his template, that's when he looks in the mirror, that's what he sees because that's what the, that's what life has shown him. Then. Um, you know, how does a carer find their way to help him see something different when he looks in that mirror? And then last but not least are the behavioural problems. And um, it's not particularly defiance and aggression um, were, you know, more than 50% mm. of, the, of the children. Um, and severe tantrums was another one. And these are, you know, tantrums that last for long periods of time. And just finishing up with these quotes, um, you know, in this example um, of the, the first quote from the professional survey, this was a five-year-old who attempted to kill a younger sibling with a gun. Um, uh, this was in the States. And then it appeared deliberate. It wasn't just a child thinking it was a toy. Um, and, you know, she's five. Um, whereas you've got the older uh, young woman who is, again, seeking love in all the wrong places. Um, and this time it's expressed through the um, unhealthy or unsafe sexual relationships. Mm. Um, and then the four-year-old are described by the carer as just not being given the guidance and nurturing during those early years. Um, so he eats few foods, he has violent tantrums um, and difficulty expressing his feelings. Um, so um, I, it's not all doom and gloom, <laughs> but I think it's really important that, you know, we... Um, we recognise that, as I said, the research is not just my research, 
But the research, you know, um, I did a literature research uh, and which I published separately, which just showed how many of these difficulties um, can even be found in surveys about people in their um, 80s and 90s um, if left unaddressed. Gee. So if, um, for instance, you know, the, these issues weren't addressed in any way, yeah. um, <laughs> I think from the, the research it states that different types of neglect predict different problems as they develop. Um, yeah. What's the impact, I suppose, overall, like, you know, like and knowing that, you know, sometimes things take years to overcome, so. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things, and I'll, I'll go to the slides in a minute, but I think if we come back to the definition, this is why I think the simple definition mm. is really helpful to remember. And if, if like, in the surveys, if, if everybody on the line here thinks of a child now either that they're caring for at the moment or that they've cared for in the past who they believe has experienced neglect think about what were the essential needs that were not met and then what would be the logical kind of impact of that if it's either consistently not met or just as dangerous unpredictably met mm. So, you know, it's it's not as common for a child, for example, to be continuously starved. But if a child um, doesn't know when they're going to be fed and when they're yeah. not, then that uncertainty means they have to survive. They have to have found a way of maximising their chances to either process food differently in their body so there'll be physical implications of that um, or behavioural implications by stealing food um, or relationship implications by running out to the, um, you know, the first person they see and asking for something. Um, I mean, I was always, when I was a child protection worker back in the day, mm -hmm. um, I still remember the three-year-old, we knocked on the door, the three-year-old came out and said, take me away. You know, and that's what he was saying to everybody. Um, and it wasn't abuse. It was neglect. Yeah. So, yeah, going back to that definition, I think, is is really useful. The other thing I will just show from the research is um, I did look at what were the links between the types of neglect and the types of problems. And... This is not to say these are the only problems that can be associated with different types of neglect, um, but it gives an example of common problems that I found if a child was described as having medical neglect, they were more likely to have atypical weight. And then you can see the logic of the physical health problems. But isn't it interesting, the last one, avoiding others? Wow, so there's yes. this relationship behaviour that was actually strongly connected to a child not knowing whether or not the adults in their life cared enough for them to treat their health problems mm. or to deal with their chronic pain, um, you know, prevent infections. And these children were more likely to avoid other people. Another, um, <clears throat> uh, emotional neglect was the highest form of, most frequent form of neglect in the survey. So therefore it was associated with all the problems. <laughs> but the most common problem that emotional neglect was associated with was children not coping with stress, which makes sense. If the child is not co-regulated by a caring adult who says, um, here, love, when they fall over and picks them up and comforts them and hugs them and reassures them, then how do they cope with stress? How do they cope when things hit the fan? Um, they will learn uh, unhealthy ways of doing that. Developmental neglect, probably no surprise, but this is really strong in the literature and it was really strong in this research. 
that developmental neglect was highly associated with language problems, fine motor and gross <laughs> motor. And what's interesting about that? So if you think developmental neglect is things like a child not learning play. So this is, it also includes children not going to school. But if you think about a three-year-old who's never had floor play, mm. you know, they've never had a parent or an adult sit on the floor with them and muck around with blocks or boxes or whatever, um, then they don't know these basic tenants that are going to help them, um, you know, to learn and develop in a whole range of ways. But the other thing that's interesting here is that la developing language is sequential. So one of the first steps for children before they develop a verbal language is fine motor skills. Again, if you think about the baby and their, their hands around their mouth while they're grasping the toys and the way they start to learn to identify sounds with touch and pointing, it's very connected to this fine motor language and there's a lot of research that shows that. Um, and of course, language, I'm on this um, group at the moment that's looking at oral language across Australia and we know that if you don't develop age appropriate language, it makes it so much harder to develop, in fact, even impossible to develop age appropriate literacy because the precursor to literacy is language. Um, so these things are all connected. Now, this I was really thrown by. I mean, it's all well and good to talk about the importance of culture and the, you know, um, why it's important that children are connected to culture. But I didn't expect this, that cultural neglect, so a child having their culture withheld from them, was strongly associated with them more likely to have this list of problems. Wow. And they were physical problems, developmental problems, relationship problems, emotional problems and behavioural problems. And even when you looked at, okay, well, maybe, and what we also found was Aboriginal children were also highly more likely than others to have many of these problems. But when we combined it, it wasn't being Aboriginal that predicted these problems and it wasn't cultural neglect that predicted these problems. It was when both happened, when the child was Aboriginal and there was cultural neglect. That's what predicted the problems, which, you know, we'll probably talk about in a minute, but I just found that really uh, compelling. Mm -hmm. And then, not surprisingly, when there's lots of different types of neglect, you see this litany of, of problems. Um, and again, all the different types of domains, physical, um, mental health, um, relationship, behavioural problems and developmental problems. So not having a child's needs met, um, go figure. Yeah. Has, has an impact. And I know it, it, it just triggered me. I was thinking, I remember we had a little boy come into care and his speech was really, really delayed. And he had never eaten anything where he had to chew, like an apple mm. or stuff. Mm. And that was one of the recommendations <laughs> that we start introducing things that he could chew to help <laughs> his language develop. So it's um, yeah, amazing what you know, can yeah make a big difference and it's simple things like that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I had a similar situation with a young woman who was 12 when I met her, but when she came into care at the age of seven, she'd never had solid food. She'd been mm. fed mostly on dog food. Oh, wow. And so um, her carers um, worked with a speech therapist and a dentist. Oh. to work on how to introduce the right types of food and then they obviously check that out with a nutritionist. But the basic thing with the mechanical parts of her learning to chew and swallow, 
I didn't realise speech therapists were experts at that, but again, they are. Um, so, yeah, it was a really interesting and, you know, by the time I met her, she was able to eat um, what you would think of as an atypical um, meal, but she had, you know, other difficulties. Mm. But, um, yeah, just seeing the patience and determination of the carers was a sight to mm. behold. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. <laughs> I might just take us um, back a little bit to the cultural aspect and, yeah. um, you know, that we, we we understand and definitely the research is showing us that, you know, if the child in, their, in care is connected to their culture, you know, we understand it's vital that the child has a positive, strong connection um, and cultural pride to assist them, you know, with day-to-day -day living things such as, you know, racism, you know, those negative <clears throat> messages that sometimes come through. So what can carers do to make sure they are connected to that child's culture? Yeah, well, look, it's so, um, it's such a big question. Mm, it and, is. I think, <laughs> and I think it's particularly interesting if you're a carer or a worker um, who's from the same culture compared to if you're not. Yes. So in the case of Aboriginal children, if you're an Aboriginal carer supported by an Aboriginal organisation, um, I think it was um, Muriel Bamblett who talked about this, their swimming in culture. Yes. Um, now, it is not possible for me growing up to have experienced cultural neglect I couldn't. Tr I couldn't walk out the door, watch television, eat a eat a meal that wasn't everything about my culture. I'm still, you know, I'm not going to say traumatized, but the whole meat and three <laughs> veg, you know, I've moved beyond. But that was my family culture, mm. um, and you know, the what we were talking earlier today about whether you talk politics at the kitchen table. Yes, family's culture. It's it's how we grow up. It's how we. So when somebody says to me, oh, my cultural background is not, a tick, not applicable, I think, no, 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 you have a cultural background, but it might just be you don't have to describe it to anybody yes. because it just, it's just around you. You know, nobody looks at what I wear and thinks it's because of my culture. No. And if I'm drunk, heaven forbid, nobody thinks it's because of my culture. If I'm having a bad day, nobody thinks it's because of my culture. And I wouldn't, you know, I remember when I was in America and somebody told me I was using the knife and fork incorrectly. And I thought, whoa, okay. Now that's such a rare experience yeah. for someone, you know, who's, um, you know, a white Australian, um, you know, uh, educated I, you know, I, I don't walk around assuming, I mean, I might, people might judge me for a whole range of reasons, but I don't ever think it's about my culture. Oh. So if I'm caring for an Aboriginal child, the first thing I have to know is I don't know. I might have read all the books. I might have Aboriginal friends. I might be really connected in some ways to what I think is culture, but I also have to recognise I won't know it all. Yes. And mm -hmm. so I have to start from a different foundation of how am I going to learn? How do I not just be the only person for this child about their culture? Can I cre help create an environment where they're swimming in it? It's just who they are mm. and it doesn't have to be this big thing. And that's one of the really big reasons why we strongly support transitioning Aboriginal children to Aboriginal care in terms of, you know, the placements being supported by yes. ACOS. Yeah. They don't have to think about this. They know it. Yes. Now, every agency, and I don't need to tell the carers online, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. But... Um, only an Aboriginal community controlled organisation is truly in a position to help um, inform not only the carers, but
but work directly with the children in that space. And if that's not possible, then it's even more important that we have Aboriginal organisations in the care team meeting. Yes. Um, and I think if we were looking at it from a different culture, if it was a child from, um, you know, Syria, mm. uh, then our difficulty is there are so many different cultures, we don't have the equivalent of echoes for every single culture. No, no. But we still need to bring that same humility <laughs> about, okay, I don't know what I don't know here, so how do I find out? Yeah. There was this great story. I um I was with some Aboriginal elders in uh, who were visiting different schools in Australia, and they said there was this one school in the outback in WA where the the school had terrible about seventy percent Aboriginal children and they had terrible results, and then one year the attendance rate went up to close to 100%. And the all the, I mean, this is before NAPLAN, but all the main testing results started to come through and it was going really well. And they thought, wow, we have to visit this school. And they were having all, before they got there, they had all these assumptions about what it was that they would find. And they thought, you know, some really experienced teacher, you know, somebody who's been around for decades. Anyway, they got there. And it was a 23-year-old, just graduated white woman from uh, Perth. And um, and they were just, and they're like, what, how, what, what, how did you, what did you do? And she said, well, I knew I didn't know. So I asked the elders to come in. And now we all teach alongside the elders. Oh, isn't that great? And so now all the kids come in. Mm. And it was just this, again, this humility, but, yeah. oh, my God, talk about wisdom. So, yeah, it's all it's going to be different every child, obviously, every family, particularly because one of the things we know, and this is where it gets really sad, is that a number of Aboriginal children in particular, I'm sure it's true for some other cultures, have learnt through their experience to be frightened of their own culture mm. or to be dismissive of it. Yeah. Yeah. Or to even be racist against it. Yeah. And, you know, we have to take our time and again work with an echo. It might be behind the scenes for a while. Um, but if you hate what you look like and if you hate where you belong from a cultural heritage point of view, that's this anchor that's going to keep holding them back. Mm. So finding a way to walk alongside, and it might be that the carer is doing that for quite a while before the child even, you know, is introduced to somebody, but um, really finding a way to to take that journey. And I've seen I've seen some carers do it. Um, is can be some of the most powerful things you can do because there is, you know. That's not a healthy path Mm. for a child to look in the mirror and go, um, even if they're pale skin, if they're racist against their own heritage, then um, it's it's a particular form of self hatred that um, it can be very destructive. Mm -hmm. So we have we have to identify that as something to be very time sensitive with, but um you know bit by bit and would there be things that um you know like making sure say having like I know this is very basic but like you know books around culture and you know even posters or artwork things like that around the house um just bringing them in a little bit by bit I'm a huge fan of therapeutic life story work yeah you know people like Richard Rose and others yeah um, where you can bring in the culture as part of their own story. Mm. Um, you know, I, I do Ancestry.com. I love discuss. I mean, even though I've got Russian heritage at the moment and Russia is not our favourite country, I'm still very proud of my, um, you know, Russian ancestry and I want to discover more. Um, and when I've done therapeutic life story work with a child in care and I had the carer with us, 
as we did this journey. Um, you know, it can be a really, really great way where they're the detective uh, and you go, okay, well, how do we find out more about this? What's a question you'd like an answer to? Let's go and find out. Mm -hmm. It might be about words. You know, the child wants to find out about, you know, you know, in our family we use, you know, what, why do people talk about deadly or whatever it might be? And you go, okay. Well, and, and so it's, again, following the child's lead. If the child, um, you know, just doesn't know, mm -hmm. then I think there are some beautiful stories around at the moment that you can find in everyday children's books shops as well as through specific Indigenous sites and like yeah. the Koori Heritage Trust and yes. um, some lovely, um, uh, you know, toys and having having <clears throat> dolls that have the same skin colour as the child, mm. um, uh, making sure that they, um, you know, are exposed to different things on television, yeah. um, different radio, um, thinking about, um, you know, who's there. But, again, just being careful that we don't think, all right, I'm going to be an expert on this culture so I can bring that into the room. Yes. It's yeah. about asking the yes. experts yeah. because you can, nobody, no one can be an expert in somebody else's culture. Yes, true. Um, we can be interested, we can be curious, we can be an ally. Um, but, yeah, it's so I think it's, and, and again, it's, you know, depending on the child's age, you mm. know, music. Um, I had to, for this child doing, I do therapeutic life story work, I had to watch Walk, The Walking Dead because that was her thing. And then, um, which, you know, I'm not into zombies. Um <laughs> But then I was, you know, able to use metaphors through it um, to help explore some pretty interesting themes for her about anger. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so it was following her lead um, and then looking for those opportunities um, mm -hmm. and then following the carer's lead because she, you know, lived with her. So she knew, you know, oh, well, you know, when we were talking about anger, she knew some of the things that were, <clears throat> um, you know, would particularly make her angry and, and we created a safe space where we could talk about it. Mm. Oh, that's great. Mm. Okay. I've rambled off the topic there. No, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all little, you know, it's, it's the ideas and the thought, you know, that we've got to explore and definitely consult, you know, with... <laughs> Um, you know, the elders and having them come to care teams and, yeah, being very much a part of that is really good to know. So mm. um, so is there anything else in regard to culture or um, that we no, might? I think, no, I think I we've think covered that. I'm sure that there'll be, yeah. um, you know, whether it's VACA or other ACOs, yeah. um, opportunities for hearing from them. Yep. Um, but I think for me, um, it's that curiosity, mm. that um, humility about somebody else's culture and following the child's lead, yeah. um, but also knowing if they're leading down a path that's not healthy, that it doesn't mean just letting them do whatever they want to do. It mm. means thinking what 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 they like what they're telling us and and the opportunities to show them other paths mm. along the way and i think that applies to whether it's culture or behavior yeah. um a whole range of things uh, and i i know like even you know attending some of the like the echoes and you know, even we run cultural days and um it's funny cuz i oh, we did a cultural day I think it was a cut that almost two years ago I think and as part of it everyone was given a little plant like an indigenous mm -hmm. plant and funnily enough mine has just started to grow yes. a little um it almost looks like a blueberry on it okay. and I can't think of the name of the plant but it is an indigenous plant yeah um and and I thought oh how amazing is that 
you know, and I'd kind of forgotten that it actually had, you know, food um, as part of it. And it, it's just gotten to that stage now where um, there's a little blue um, fruit, I suppose, in it. Yeah, um, yeah someone... and I think, <clears throat> you know, I can remember um, working with a, a child in uh, foster care who was um, the placement had to stop. The carer had said she couldn't cope with the child's behaviour anymore. Yeah. And um, it was an Aboriginal child. And we didn't know yet where the other placement was going to be. And I went up to visit her with an Aboriginal worker. And we were thinking on the way, you know, it was, you know it's, I think she was seven or eight. Um, and she was, you know, she had some very, um, she wasn't just boisterous. She had, you know, some really explosive behaviours which had um, scared the carer. And um, because the carer had younger children, just to put some context in yeah. there. <clears throat> and we were sitting by the river, the Murray, actually, and... I realised this child was very distressed as we were talking to her and I realised then this, the, the worker who was, um, you know, not particularly experienced in foster care but had a lot of life experience, started talking to the child in and out of language. Oh. Just the odd word and it was rhythmic and I was just like, I don't even need to be here, but what a privilege to be here. Yes. Sitting yeah. by this river as this worker was able to comfort her in language and in a way where the child was able to start taking a breath mm. and trusting us that, you know, we would find somewhere for her that night and she ended up um, going to her grandparents. But um it was one of those, you know, surprises. <laughs> it was just mm. a delight to be a part of. Oh, that would have been amazing. Mm. For sure. And I don't think the worker knew she was going to do that. <laughs> but, you know, they yeah. have the same language. And, of course, there's 250 languages. So <laughs> that's not automatic. No, um, not at all. And, uh, but, yeah, it was, it was such a powerful thing to see yeah. that in the healing part of that in the moment. Mm. Now, there's no way. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I'm not good at languages. I'm trying to learn Japanese at the moment and I'm useless. <laughs> There's no all, way. All I can say is konnichiwa. <laughs> Indeed. Um, there's no way I could have even pretended to have done that. No, no. Oh, that's incredible. I suppose the only other thing I can think of is, um, you know, are there any other um, things that perhaps carers could do to help a child to recover, you know, like yeah. day-to-day -day <clears throat> things that, yeah. Um, or messages, you know, anything like that that can help them to yeah. overcome that neglect. Let's get on to that, hey? Yeah. We've, we've talked about some pretty serious stuff. Yeah. Um, again, I might just show some slides and yep. um, and yeah. then uh, and then stop sharing them so we can uh, see everybody, particularly when we want to talk and, and have questions. But... Um, and I'm just going to share some, I think, some simple, I say simple, um, they're, doesn't mean they're easy. <laughs> so the, the first is this, it comes back to our definition. You're going to be sick of me talking about this definition. But I'd say one of the first things to do is to think about the difference between the child's daily um, so distinguish between their daily um, ordinary needs and their long-term needs because we can't meet their long-term needs unless their daily needs are met. Now, that's obvious. You know, people will probably be rolling their eyes going, yeah. <laughs> um, what we found in the research was carers provided these great examples of how these ordinary needs had become extraordinary. And we, we, you and I talked about the example of the children who didn't know how to chew food. Mm. So feeding a child is an ordinary need. 
but it becomes extraordinary if we can't feed them the way we would feed other children of the same age. So we have to think of, and the other really big example is, how do we hug a child mm. um, if they're t touch averse? Yes. Or if they're indiscriminate or if they're, um, uh, you know, don't have sexual health boundaries. Mm. And now touch is a human need. It's a human right. It's actually, as you know, we will die. Human, particularly children, will die without touch. The question isn't whether to do it, it's how to do it, and when yeah. to do it. And it seems crazy that we need to think about this for some children, but we really do. I'm sure there are carers online who've had children where they've had to be really careful about, um, you know, how they how they do hugs. I remember with um, a couple of the children I had in my care, um, they were too old to need me to be in the bathroom, but the particular um, bath I had was a spa bath and you couldn't leave children in it unattended, right? And they were highly, highly private. And so I said to them, and they really wanted to put the spa bath on, and I said, okay, great idea, but that would mean I'd need to be in the room. How do we make that possible? for this particular situation and they were fine we want we'll put our bathing suits on that's what worked for them well that's a good idea um and so it was giving them that's an example of giving i put the parameters around mm. but they took the lead about how they were going to make it happen so how we this is the the real crux of it is how do we meet both the ordinary needs and the new needs that have developed because of their experience of neglect now, one of the key things I would say here is often we talk about, you know, I gave you before that list of problems, physical mm. health problems um, like sleep, developmental problems like language, relationship problems, emotional health problems. And for each of those problems, you can come up with different strategies. And for some of them, you need to have, like like I gave the example with the child who needed speech therapy and the dentist to learn how to swallow. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's not about the list of problems. It's about what were the needs that were not met and how do we meet those needs today? Mm. And if we don't know for sure, because the child may not tell us and people may not know, we can often guess, have an educated guess based on the behaviour and what we're seeing from the child. So if we know <clears throat> that they've experienced, you know, sometimes you might see in a report neglect, well, that could mean 20 things. <laughs> so actually finding out what was it that they didn't get and how do I gradually introduce that into their life? Is it about um, reading a story at mm -hmm. bedtime? Okay, they're not going to like that because of what that means for them at bedtime. So maybe I remember one carer who said, so I did it before bedtime oh. and I actually created an opportunity in the lounge room where there was a, um, a quieter space that became their nighttime routine but where she could settle them outside of the bedroom because the mm. bedroom was, um, you know, had other um, triggers for them. And so, you know, there's often, there's an old saying about um, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what's happened to you. And I know um, Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey have written a, a recently a great book about this, and it's predominantly about trauma. Mm. But from a neglect point of view, it's also saying it's not what's wrong with you, it's what didn't happen. Yeah. So the more we can find out, experiment, be curious, trial and error, and think, okay, I don't think this child has had a routine 
well, I'm sure everybody here knows you can't just whack in a routine and bang, the child suddenly does it. So how do you introduce that routine? How do you um, work with the child care centre, the school, preschool, whatever, to create these routines in ways that the child can gradually make sense of them and learn um, to adjust? So I think this whole issue of um, building on the ordinary needs the other key thing, and it relates to this, is if something was absent, it's bringing it now to make it present. Doesn't mean we're going to meet every need continuously because we're not robots and nor is the child. And also, obviously, their needs are going to um, change as, um, as they get older. But it's how do we find this way of meeting their ordinary and extraordinary needs on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, I thought I'd finish with um, this, and I've got a – I'll look at a couple of pieces in particular detail. But I did this diagram specifically based on what the carers said in the study. And as you can see here, what the carers told me through their surveys, firstly, in this big circle, is what the child needs. Now, this isn't, again, not going to be a big surprise to everybody here, but I think it's so important that we hold it up and say, how do we get, how do we help these needs be met? Mm. If well, There's no question children need love, but if mm. they haven't had it, or if they've had it in a destructive way, how are we going to have those needs met? And it may not just be the carers who do it. It might be that, you know, grandma or, you know, there's somebody else in the family or yeah, the parents that we, there's ways in which we collectively help, say, for example, mum who loves her child but may be clueless about 20 other things well, she still loves the child, so at least the child can see and experience that love, even if we need to do everything else. Um, touch, I've talked about before, health, safety, communication, structure and routine, not surprising, was a big theme. Play was a big theme. Mm. You know, sometimes we might have a six-year-old who actually needs parallel play like it's a toddler because they're not they're, they're not ready yet for that to and fro. Um, they need friendships. If they're not good at friendships, then we need to help scaffold that, you know, talking to other parents or teachers about how do we wrap um, uh, some kids their own age or a little bit older to show them how to be a friend. Of course they need education, of course they need culture, and they need to experience and catch up on what they've missed. Mm -hmm. And then what the carer acts to are meeting those needs. And this has all come from the surveys from carers. So loving the child. There were so many different words for cuddles, hugs, holds, um, which was beautiful, comfort and reassurance, protecting the child, feeding the child. These are basic things. doesn't mean they're easy. Um, and, of course, you know, what the carer needs to be, patient, able to recognise what is and isn't, and being trustworthy. You know, we often talk about does the child trust people? Um, are the people they trust trustworthy? We can't promise everything, but we can promise, hopefully, to be trustworthy, to be worthy of their trust. The other thing I looked at in this bigger picture, I'll just go, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Go back to, um, no, no, hold on. There we go. Can you see the slide again? Don't yet. No, stop. not yet. Okay, I'll just stop sharing and then, okay. Yep, found it again. Um, so just going back to the um this bigger picture the other thing that we looked at were the dimensions in other words in particular time and place 
And so just looking at those in more detail, incredibly consistent themes about predictability, repetition, thinking about the sequence of things, it being this is a day and night job, um, but also carers recognising that the child needs time. In terms of place, it was fascinating to see the different examples that carers used about conversations, play, teaching moments, whether it was in the bedroom, the lounge room, <laughs> uh, the toilet, the laundry, or whether it was outside the home. So these things are not limited to, obviously, we know they're not limited to a therapy session or a meeting with the social worker. Um, it's this 24-7. Um, we know, I think it's from memory, 167 hours, 168 hours in the week. Um, how do we make as much of that restorative and therapeutic? So it's not that they need therapy 168 hours a week because you really would need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's how do you make those moments healing, therapeutic? Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do we keep bringing our best selves? Um, when we're tired, you know, so um, I think it's so critical that we support the carers mm -hmm. in order to support, yeah. the, in order to be yeah. patient and um, creative and everything mm -hmm. else um, for the children. And it can sometimes, you know, taking care of yourself. And we know, you know, we've heard many carers sort of, they feel quite guilty about looking after themselves. But if you don't look after yourself first, you know, then you're not then available to help the child. And, you know, we know it can be, you know, very demanding and kids' behaviour can be very challenging. So it's a lot of hard work. And so making sure that you do take that little bit of time for yourself can make all the difference in the world. That's right. And we know... Um... You know, again, taking care of ourselves is different mm. for each of us. Um, mm. For some, you know, for me, um, I'm sometimes I like a good wallow. <laughs> I like to grab a friend and talk about how terrible things are and then I feel like I'm good, yeah. <laughs> ready to go. Other friends were like, no, 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 that would take them down a different way and they need to do something, you know, they need to go for a run or mm. um need to be able to go to the toilet without somebody coming into the room <laughs> all the things that people take for granted that you know you can't do um all the time if you're a carer so no you know the old ad the old example of you need to put the oxygen mask on before you do it for the children um i mean that's it's true yeah, yeah if, it um, we cannot keep children safe if we're not safe it's, yes. you know, it's it's not a it's not an either or. No, not at all. No. And it's knowing, I suppose at some level, it's almost knowing your limitations, isn't it? You know, and knowing, yeah. you know, if you're getting that <laughs> sort of riled up, it's, okay, I need to go to the bathroom <laughs> or I need to you know, go out of the room for a minute or two and just sort That's of right. deep breathe yeah. and do all those things. Mm. Have a chat with the, you know, with my worker or... Yeah. Um, if there's a clinician involved or um, or if that's not meeting my needs, letting them know it's not mm. meeting my needs. Yeah. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm not finding this helpful. Can we talk about what, what would be helpful? Yeah, yeah. And that's um, so vital. Uh, mm. Mm, great. All right. Um, I might, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat. I haven't had a chance. Uh, I'll just see if I can I open. I think so, but people might want. I don't know if people can go off mute if they've got any questions yeah, or comments. Yeah. What I'll do, I might stop recording, right, and okay. then we can get everyone to, um, yeah, just hopefully get this right. Stop oh, recording. Okay. Yeah. All right.